Hi everyone and welcome to today's webinar sponsored by Hula Partners. Today's topic is putting your organization on the path to talent-based management. My name is Ashton Pusquelic and I am the head of marketing at Hula Partners. So as promised, we do have three speakers with us today. We have Giles Adam from ConocoPhillips, Tobias Gluck from Cameron International, and Catherine Kovar from One Subsea. Um, you will be able to find all of them on LinkedIn after this if you would like to reach out to them personally. So before I hand it over to our speakers, just a quick housekeeping item. So you guys can see on the screen right there that um, if you would like to ask a question, you may do so through the question box on your GoToWebinar control, control panel. So all you do is just type in your question send it in and then at the end of the session we will be answering all of the questions in order that they were received if for some reason we don't get through all of the questions we will answer those offline so just look for those in your inboxes so today um, our moderator for the session will be jai shaw jai shaw is the managing partner at hula partners and currently serves as the head of technology solutions he has over 20 years of experience in architecting software solutions, and his portfolio includes ERP and custom developed software delivered to large multinational corporations. So without further ado, Jai Shah. Thanks, Ashton. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, ha happy to uh, host this webinar today with uh, some, some customers of ours who we uh, very much welcome um, to the conversation around competency management. So I'm going to have each of them introduce themselves. And, and uh, so guys, if you could just kind of give a brief bio and then um, also talk a little bit in the introduction about your association with the competency programs within each of your uh, respective organizations. That would be great. So we'll start with uh, Giles Adams. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me for my voice. It's a little bit uh, broken today and uh, with a sore throat. But um, yes, I'm the uh, uh, director of the Global Competency Program, so very much directly related with uh, the Competency Program here in ConocoPhillips. Um, I've been with ConocoPhillips for one year now. Um, prior to that, I've got a, a total of 25 years uh, experience in the oil field, uh, both uh, as an engineer working on a well site. Uh, and then 12 years in uh, training and development roles, and uh, ultimately five years as uh, competency, uh, global competency manager uh, with Baker Hughes. Thank you. All right, so uh, Tobias Gluck. Yeah, hello everyone. My name is Tobias Gluck. I'm the VP of HR for the Surface Systems Division of Cameron International. Um, I'm leading an initiative that we call the Hire to Retire Initiative for Engineering, and that was our starting point to look into competencies, so that's one of the work streams. And we started off actually to look at competencies several years ago and, well, work with Excel spreadsheets at the beginning, and that didn't really work that well. So over the past year, we looked at options, uh, software solutions that could support us, and so now we're uh, from one year ago already quite a, a bit uh, uh, we went into the right direction to find a solution for that so I'll be happy to talk about that some more during the call. Great and then Catherine Kovar. Hi my name is Catherine Kovar and I'm the engineering training manager for One Sub C which is a uh, joint venture between Cameron and Schlumberger. And I joined the organization and as an engineering training manager and working on the competencies, um, helping to support Tobias in the rollout for both Cameron and One Sub C of our engineering hire to retire and the engineering competency program. And prior to working for uh, One Sub C, uh, I was with Hewlett Packard in the uh, technical development as well as the uh, technical training department and training partners and customers and service representatives uh, for over 15 years. Great. All right. Well, so the, the uh, thank you guys. The, the subject really for today is um, helping customers kind of overcome the inertia of getting started with the competency program. So 
uh, really the discussion is going to focus around a series of topics that we've found to be um, uh, challenges in how you get started in implementing a competency architecture framework. So uh, to that end, I'm just going to facilitate an open discussion um, between our panelists around these various topics. So the first one is really around uh, defining competency management. So, you know, before we can implement a program, we need to define what that program is going to consist of. And so I'm wondering, uh, maybe Giles, if you can talk first about uh, what competency management means to ConocoPhillips and, um, you know, and, and talk about that in a broad sense in terms of the entire demographic that may be eventually be covered under a competency assurance program. Sure. So, uh, ConocoPhillips has had a uh, had competency programs, uh, competency management for, for many years, but it's been very uh, fractured and done independently by different groups, whether geographical or different functions within the organization. So uh, as a result, there are um, many initiatives, uh, but very disconnected and with all different uh, flavors uh, to them, I suppose. Like you could say. Um, from the point of view of uh, what competency management is, uh, the way I've been trying to analyze what we've got here um, and what we've been doing in the past is I try to break it down into really sort of four main areas. Uh, the definition of competencies themselves, so the quality of the definitions, how well they're written, but also what the granularity uh, that's that. Uh, so essentially, are we at least measuring against the standard that's well defined and, and is agreed on? Um, processes in terms of how we do the assessment, whether we're doing self-assessment uh, uh, or um, a much more rigorous uh, assessment which would stand up to audit and, um, uh, in the processes. And then the data, where the data is all stored as an outcome of this process. Uh, and how we use that data and so ultimately the outcomes, business value, what are we actually doing this for, what can we then use that data to, to affect. So really uh, a lot of this is sort of taking uh, existing programs uh, and analyzing for those pieces and trying to get some continual consistency across the organization uh, so we can actually see that big data and get the real value out. Uh, but at the same time, we're also working with new groups um, all the time who are coming to the table wanting competencies and so also putting processes to how to develop all of these pieces and make the right choices to end with a, uh, a valuable competency management program. Great. Um, thank you. And so, to, Tobias, um, on, from, a, from a Cameron perspective, you guys kind of started on the engineering side. Uh, can you talk specifically about uh, how you view competency management in, in terms of the overall employee experience, employee life cycle uh, from, from the Cameron Engineering uh, perspective? Sure. Well, at first, um, I'd like to clarify what, what we, when we talk about competencies in our company, what we were primarily looking at uh, right now was uh, technical competencies. So we were we are focusing on engineering, and we also are looking into field services, as those are the two big groups in our company that we have to address when it comes to competencies. So we we have we're looking at the technical piece. where we don't want to neglect all the behavioral stuff, but this is really not part of um, the rollout or the priorities that we have set for the beginning. So for the technical competencies, we uh, had a discussion in which we involved everyone in the in the company means all the different divisions to make sure that we get um, the same process and the same tools and the same software in place for all divisions and for all groups rather than having uh, um, well several different solutions and uh, it's similar to what Giles said we we are coming from that where we have different uh, software solutions, different uh, tools, and also, of course, some divisions that are more advanced than others. So we try to bring everyone to the same level um, and utilize um, the knowledge that we have and also the, the, the tools that we have in place already. So that was a collaborative process to develop that, to develop the competencies, to develop the 
um, the process now. I'll let Catherine talk some more about how they did that, how they developed the competencies. And I think we found a good way how we could integrate um, everyone and uh, basically really um, put something together where we have a core um, that is addressing uh, all engineers or all field service technicians, but then at the same time also pay attention to the differences between divisions and functions. Yeah, so that's a great lead into the next uh, the next topic, which is really um, after you kind of gain consensus on the over broad, the broad definition, then obviously there's those kind of um, challenges to accommodate everybody's specific requirements within that broad definition of competency management. So as you mentioned, I know Catherine did a lot of work um, around that, that and went through a very tactical exercise. So Catherine, can you talk about some of those challenges and, and how you guys ended up structuring a catalog that accommodated everybody's needs? Yes. Um, what we uh, came to the table with, each one of the divisions um, created their, what we would consider their competencies, their core competencies. And through several different workshops, the divisions, the representatives, the engineers from each one, we went through all those competencies and found the common ground uh, amongst all of us. And surprisingly, you know, you get a bunch of engineers in the room and everyone's going to be unique. And when you start talking about competencies, it gets even better. They were wonderful in coming up and saying, no, we are the same on this. We all agree that we need to have these items. Through, so, so, through several different workshops, we were able to come up with what we deemed the core competencies that go across our entire organization. From that core, we were able then to push and say certain items are very applicable to divisions or you know separate companies. So example, as, as our company is uh, broken down into Cameron surface and Cameron drilling and Cameron valves and measurements, um, each one of those divisions then had the capability of having specified competencies that apply to them and their engineers. Then the next level down from that, we created uh, more role specific. Um, so if you are a uh, design engineer in a, a valves and measurement, they're in the valves group, what are the competencies that apply there? By doing that, we can maintain the core competencies being a smaller set and then have the build on, similar to Lego blocks, to have each division be able to add and have their specialized, and then even go to, as I said, role. And this allowed us to have the flexibility where everyone might have uniqueness, but also have some common ground. This also allows us, as our people move from different divisions, that when you're, you've got someone coming over from surface, over into the drilling group, you know that they have the core. And you also know that there are going to be those division ones that um, maybe is not required for your division, but is an enhancement to your division that's coming from that other one. So we did it as a Lego block, keeping uh, the core as minimized as possible, and then the build-ons also to be minimized as possible uh, so that we would also have the future growth. Great. And, and um... Giles, I'd like you to kind of follow on um, and talk a little bit about not only because uh, you got you. I think Conoco has some geographic uh, experience in terms of uh, specific local requirement, truly local geographic requirements, but also um, you know balancing uh, really two different demographics: your operator population and your um, and your and your engineering or your drilling and completions type population and how you balanced all of that in, in terms of a, a, you know, one or different models that were accommodated within one program, if you will. Yeah, the, yeah that's correct. We have um, uh, a lot of, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, a lot of local programs uh, or a lot of variations of different programs that have been created over a, a long period of time uh, without that uh, sort of coordination as to what are the pros and cons of doing it in different ways. Um, and certainly when we look at the uh, field operator uh, population, uh, it's all done entirely local. So every business unit has done their own and there's no consistency or, or uh, over, 
fight as to um, how those competencies are even designed, let alone measured. So that's certainly a, a work in progress to try to look for those commonalities and bring that together uh, from historical uh, pieces. But the reality is that that population is also not very mobile um, as well, and uh, so the consequences are actually fairly small uh, in as much as the people don't move around that much, whether geographically um, or, or, or even particularly um, uh, within the organization hierarchically. And so the transportability of the competencies is, is certainly a less of an issue. With the engineering population, uh, that transportability is critical. Uh, we have a, a large amount of movement, and we want to make sure that people, that we do this in a consistent way globally. Um, and so that's what we've just rolled out in the last year is a, is a global uh, wells program for the, for the wells engineering groups, for example, uh, and all of the function groups for engineering, uh, for engineering disciplines are, um, are global. Uh, for that exact reason. Um, we really want them to be transportable. We need them to be consistent. Uh, we don't want to reassess every time someone moves from one location to another. At, at the same time, there's still the issue of how these, the, the sort of a hybrid where we have uh, just uh, as Catherine was describing, the, the hybrid where you have the global requirements and some add-on local uh, requirements. And uh, we're also doing that. Uh, so that hybrid model, um, and the way I would, uh, I think Catherine's describing Lego bricks, I would describe a, uh, a library of books on shelves organized by discipline, but an individual gets a specific reading list, which can select from different libraries and different uh, shelves. Um, so that kind of profiling down to the individual, I think, is a critical piece to make sure that you don't broad brush everyone with the job title with exactly the same competencies. It needs to be, they need to be correct and specific to the requirements of the individual's uh, specific role. Right. And, and Tobias, so, um, you know, kind of the goals being uh, important, right? And you spoke about that at the beginning in terms of what you're going to get out of, out of this program. And I know that, um, so you, you've, you've been able to accommodate through your core business unit product line or role specific competencies um, for, tailored to an individual, but then how does that relate to how you see development, actual talent development and um, the process or visibility around the development side of competency management? Well, if I look at the question and the two groups that we are currently looking at, engineering and field services, then for engineering, it's easy to answer that this is really for developmental purposes at first. For field services, it's a little different. So for them, it's, it's about assurance and making sure that they are competent when they go out to the customer. For engineering, um, that, that's really more for developing the workforce and gaining competencies in, in the organization and also helping each individual to grow their career uh, within Cameron and uh, move on on the career ladder. So for, for those guys, it's really more important that we focus on how can they develop uh, their competencies, how can they advance in the organization and well, if we look at the goals that we have, and of course it, it is a benefit for both parties. It's, they advance quicker, but we also um, develop competencies quicker and can move people on to bigger projects, for example, or give them um, more important or more difficult work uh, sooner than in the past. So that's, that's, those are the main goals for our competency system. And um, Giles, back to you for a second. Um, You've talked about the the operator um, kind of the the operator job families and 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 uh, functions. Do you see the same same challenge in terms of uh, a development model and a compliance model and the tension between those two? Do you see uh, being able to accommodate those all within an overall governance structure and and model? So absolutely, we see the same thing. Um, uh, the operators, project leads, et cetera, out in the field are um, either regulatory or uh, compliance or safety-based programs that are um, uh, required of the, of the individuals 
to be able to operate, to be able to do their job. Mm -hmm. um, the, we have some engineering, so for example, the wells engineering uh, which is also seen as safety critical and regulatory um, and mandatory. Uh, but the rest of engineering is much more uh, much more similar to what uh, Tobias is describing, where it is uh, very much developmental, uh, aspirational, uh, tied to career development programs, etc. And uh, with uh, so not mandatory, but um, uh, and I'm not, I don't mean mandatory in the sense of they don't need to do it at all, but not mandatory as in you can't function in your role without having completed the comp. So very much developmental or aspirational, um, much more like a leadership style competency. So I, we've put those, the, them into three different buckets there. We've got that, um, and they need different approaches. So that's why we separate them out. It's kind of almost unfortunate they're all called competencies um, because people mix them. But uh, we, we have that um, functional, mandatory, regulatory, safety, critical safety um, that we assure. We have the developmental, which are out there for development purposes, and then we have the leadership, which really applies to everybody, which are also developmental, but they're a bit of a different nature themselves as well. Okay, yeah, that's that's a good explanation. Uh, so, Catherine, you know, you've been through uh, a, a rollout recently. Um, so, can you talk a little bit about some of the the best practices from a change management uh, phased approach, uh, how much time you spent on training the technology versus training the process, how you got some buy-in and ownership over you know, introducing an assessment process to groups of employees that maybe never had done assessments before, um, and how that, that worked for you. Um, one of the pieces that I think is, is critical to the excess of the the whole process is, is obviously the communications and both engaging uh, from our human resources and our engineering groups, uh, engineering upper management, all together so that the objectives of the program, what we were trying to achieve could be communicated. Uh, being able to put out to everyone that we are, you know, this is for a learning and development. The, uh, because uh, many times competencies get wrapped into immediately performance. And that was one thing, having HR in the room with engineering is to set the, the correct objectives for our rollout and moving forward with this, how we plan on using this information and the value that it brings to the business as well as to an employee development. The pieces that were uh, very important to us was uh, getting all the individuals together, understanding those objectives, um, setting the timelines for our implementation, and the, also allowing them to see what kind of feedback mechanisms that we were going to have if they didn't agree with certain competencies, if they didn't, you know, uh, if they thought that they uh, needed to have a little bit more clarification. So what we did is, is with our kickoff meeting, we also then had after that a training session. Uh, and it was minimal in, in the grand scheme of things because the system that we implemented was very intuitive, but it was the front end of it to say, you know, we're going to do an employee assessment, then a management assessment, and then after that you're going to be creating your learning and development plan. And then they knew the whole process and what the outcome was from that was that you were going to have now a complete learning and development plan to implement off of. So, that to us helped it uh, every, set up everybody's expectations and also got their buy-in that they they saw what the outcome and what was in it for them, um, you know, by going through this whole process with the system. Great, and and Giles in, in the Conoco Phillips landscape, I believe you you've pretty much fully implemented globally for your Wells division, but I think you're tackling a, a new. A new model, or for the first time, rolling out to lower 48. So, any lessons learned that you've taken from the Wells rollout to uh, to the to the lower 48, you know, current rollout, or um, any any words of wisdom for people who are getting ready to deploy? Um, so, <clears throat> again, I think the nature of the competencies between operator-style competencies and engineering make a significant difference to to the rollout as uh, but 
the design right from the very beginning sets you up for success or failure because if you overcomplicate it um, and put too much of a burden on the organization, uh, I think you're you're uh, pretty much doomed to, to a lot of pushback, if not failure. So I think one of the designing it right for the audience is critical. Um, um, we have to recognize that there's a lot of effort put in by the business, or we're putting a burden on the business uh, asking them to do this. So we have to sell the benefit and we have to make it as streamlined a process as possible. Uh, so the rollout process, um, I think very similar to what Catherine described, uh, you know, a lot of communication, a lot of change management, a lot of making sure that they understand the big picture and why we're doing it because they won't, all, uh, especially on the, uh, the operator competencies, don't necessarily see immediate benefit uh, in a matter of months. This can often be a quite a long-term uh, exercise before they really see big enough sets of data to be able to see trends and to be able to see where their gaps are and that they can actually improve operations uh, and focus on uh, specific improvement areas. Uh, and also the training that needs to go with this because competencies really need to all be tied in with you know multiple other pieces and if the training is missing to go with it that's also a, a, a big issue and I think that's a big issue for us at the moment. Um, we're wanting the competency data to point us at where we want to uh, spend our training dollars, especially in these uh, tight times, so to have the most impact. Um, but you, you need to have the competency program at a certain level of maturity before that becomes a reality. So uh, it's very much the, the, the big picture and that there is a benefit and there needs to be a what's in it for me at, at all the levels of the communication. Uh, but um, certainly there, there's also a long-term aspect they need to understand. Yeah, so to that end, I guess, Tobias, um, you know, looking at how you collected feedback, how you dealt with feedback um, in terms of explaining the win to your audience, you know, from, from their perspective, but also from, from, from HR's perspective and being able to get data and more uh, accurately direct uh, development activities. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how you man maybe managed uh, from an executive level uh, the, the conversations with your peers on the operations side and the win-win proposition as well as how you were going to collect and disposition their feedback not only on technology but on content, the actual competencies themselves? Yeah, I think what we learned is, is really, um, well, there were a lot of different things. So one was, I think we underestimated a little bit that we need to explain in detail how the competency system um, is connected to other pieces of development. So how does it interact with training, for example? So is there, if you have a gap somewhere, is there a training or is it on-the-job training or how do you close the gap? Uh, we got some feedback about uh, training for managers to do and go through the process. That is something that we are picking up now and that we need to work on so that we provide some more guidance to our management how to uh, use the process, how to use the tool. And then um, I think we'll, we'll learn through that, that what, what we can do better so that um, people better understand how that all is linked together. The same question came up when it comes to career development. So if I'm competent in, in all the competencies that I have for my profile, will I then move up to the next level or what do I have to do for that? So we got quite a few questions on that. So that's something that we, we need to answer. And it is a good thing on the one hand because people take a very active role when it comes to their career development. On the other hand, you also have to manage expectations. So people obviously have an idea that they are promoted at some point. They would like to know how this process helps them with that. So that's something that, that we need to explain in detail and let them know um, how they influence it with their technical competencies, but their technical competencies are not the only um, thing that is inf influencing when someone will get a promotion. So that's when we have to talk about other skills like um, communication or also just general performance on the job um, before we are uh, promoting someone. 
So that is one thing that, but then also I think your question was touching on the continuous improvement process for the competencies and the process itself, and we got a lot of feedback on that. So when we went through the pilot phase, we got a lot of feedback about uh, what we can do better or how can we, we can better define competencies. We got quite some feedback on the process, on what's uh, running well, what we can do differently. And so we started having feedback logs to capture all that feedback. And we used it then also to, to provide um, some updates to our senior management to give them an idea of how the pilot went, what's working well so far, and uh, what we still have to work on. Jai, I'm going to chime in as well to, to Tobias's point. One component that was extremely valuable to us is to break it down into those different pieces as he identified the competencies, the process, and also the system because that way they could focus on the area and not, you know, if just say this competency was terrible when, no, no, it wasn't the competency was, was terrible, you didn't like that. It's that you didn't like um, the placement of it, or you didn't think it was the right level, or you know another component of it. We broke it down into those three different type of categories because then we could address each one as it as it needed to be. Yeah. So I guess that's you know the the, the um, one of the challenges that I think a, a lot of our customers are facing along this is is this a point in time. Uh, you know, roll out, or do you view this as a, a life cycle of, you know, a total culture change, um, introducing a process that uh, will hopefully be a sustaining process? And I guess, Giles, from your perspective, I mean, I, I kind of know the answer for, from all of you in terms of hopes, um, but, you know, what are we doing to, to ensure that competency management is a sustaining program? Um, and so, Giles, maybe from a ConocoPhillips perspective, you know, what's been the, the reaction and the buy-in from the groups where you've more formally rolled this out in a comprehensive global governance model? Um, in, the, uh, in the global rollout, uh, we are still relatively young in as much as we've only just finished the, the Wells global rollout. Um, but uh, as far as I mean, obviously, we want this to be a, uh, a culture change and a, something that gets embedded into standard work practices and gets thought of in a, let's say, not dissimilar way to uh, performance management or maybe even more common than that, and uh, so, so that uh, this is a, a discussion between the supervisors and, uh, and the employees on a, on a frequent basis to direct the training, et cetera. Uh, I think um, one of the learnings was uh, some of the business units went after it, took the bull by the horns, as it were, and uh, uh, charged on and um, uh, did a huge number of assessments and completed everything required within a couple of months. And although I applaud their efforts, I think that uh, they also see now that uh, down the road, that means they've got now nothing to do. Um, for a couple of years, and then they're going to have a whole slew of uh, it all coming round again. They've got to put a big effort in again. So I think that uh, one of the recommendations I would definitely have is to to spread out the the, the launch so that uh, it gets more evenly spread over time. Um, I think that it's much more likely then to become part of a business process in a more consistent way. And obviously that. That big push that they put in will slowly break down with new employees, with other people coming in. But at the same time, uh, I feel like they wanted to get it off their plate and almost forget about it. So I'm kind of that that kind of activity. Although I say I, I applaud it, it also concerns me. Yeah, understood. Yeah, I think the the challenge is how do you how do you ingrain this into the culture versus uh, making it like like we talked about a point in time exercise that comes around every once in a while um, versus you know just something people think about in their in their daily jobs. So yeah, I'm going to ask. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. I was just going to add one more thing on that. Then is um, is just as Tobias mentioned earlier on the tie into other talent management initiatives, other talent management processes. 
I think is the critical piece to keep it going. So do we bring competencies into performance management, not equate them, but is, let, for, let's say, developmental, um, our developmental goals uh, to develop some competencies, for example? Um, are, are they in the career development programs? And so there's a, there's a lot of tie-ins there that uh, make them have value and also make them real and thought about. I think that that's a very important piece for us. Giles, to add on to that, one of the things that we are seeing with our implementation is that our engineers um, have embraced it from a, as I complete and develop myself, they've taken ownership of their learning and development and their, and, and their growth within the company. And by doing that, it's not a one and done. So as they achieve different competencies um, through, you know, on the job or doing different uh, classes and uh, activities, then they are assessing themselves and telling their manager, hey, I, I've now achieved this competence, you know, competency. I'd like you to reevaluate me. And they're excited about having that opportunity because they're now in charge of it instead of waiting for someone to potentially assign training to them or assign, you know, different things that they need to do for development. And we're watching it and I'm really excited to see them embracing that and taking that ownership. Yeah, and I mean, if we go back to the title of today's webinar, which is putting your organization on, on the path to talent or competency-based talent management, we, we firmly believe that that, that um, currency, if you will, of a competency and a proficiency uh, really should be the thing guiding uh, many of the investments, be it learning, development, um, if it recruiting and workforce deployment type activities uh, in large part. So I guess I'll end with my last question to each of you, and then I think we have some audience questions. Um, but my last question would be, uh, do you, just quick answer in terms of whether you view these, uh, these programs as HR operations, or truly a collaboration between HR and operations uh, in terms of your competency uh, management rollouts? It is, of course, a collaboration between everyone involved. But the key thing is that the function or the operations is driving it. So if they do not buy into it, it would be very difficult to roll it out. Those are the guys that would tell the workforce to do it and to put a, make it a priority and we are lucky enough that we have that support and uh, therefore I think it, it will run it successfully. Uh, without it, I, I don't think it would be possible. And Giles, from your perspective? Yeah, so for us, it's actually, so it's absolutely a collaboration. I couldn't agree more. Um, I think, uh, Operation certainly on the uh, sort of operations uh, um, uh, type competencies and the technical um, piece, operations absolutely own them. So they're the uh, program owners, uh, they're the program administrators once it's up and running. We're providing the framework and the mechanism and the consistency and the governance for them to set it up, but they're, they, they end up as the owners. Uh, and I couldn't agree more with Tobias. You know, it, it really wouldn't work without that because it's their initiative and their buy-in, um, them running it. Uh, the difference, however, is that in the uh, engineering space where we've got global, um, uh, for example, in the Wells uh, engineering space, uh, it's owned by the function. So it's still not owned by HR, it's owned by the function, um, but at a global level. Um, and really, I, I guess it's the nature of the program, uh, the fact that whether it's a local or a global program, um, as to who ends up owning it. Um, but, in, but it's certainly not HR. All right, excellent. Well, thank you, guys. I'm going to turn it over to Ashton to, to um, uh, ask the questions from the audience, and then I'll be back to, to kind of wrap up, wrap up the discussion. Okay, guys, I have a couple of questions, and it looks like we have about five minutes left. So um, just real quick, 
One question from the audience is, uh, when rolling out a competency management framework, did you go big bang or phased approach? Well, we are going with a phased approach. I think we've learned uh, from the pilot uh, program that it's just uh, too much to handle from a communication perspective uh, if you, we, we would do several thousand employees at once. So we'll break it up into chunks and uh, we'll, we'll implement it in phases. And I think the same for us. It's uh, very definitely um, taking one bite at a time as to what, how much we can handle, uh, how much we can support. Uh, and also that allows us to prioritize on the, the greatest uh, risk exposure and um, uh, highest um, priority on the safety side. So we have a prioritization piece as well. There. Okay, thank you guys. Uh, next question is, do you have any tips or best practices on gaining agreement on competency performance criteria content? So uh, probably Catherine might be might be a good one for you. So in some of your you know negotiating between different functional groups and and being the moderator, um, did you how how did you kind of get two groups to agree where you really needed to standardize and and maybe people were hanging on to their very um, I guess uh, uh, kind of um, their jurisdiction and and you having to to make sure they understood the greater good. Well, I think because of the, the way that we determined to, to implement, as I said, a core and a divisional and then a role, is they had the opportunity to know that it did it really need to be in the core um, and that the opportunity was then they could put it in a divisional area. So if you have it completely that everything needs to be in one area, then there's going to be a little bit more discussion and challenges with trying to come to an agreement on it. We did set up some guiding principles, though, uh, in our workshops, and we were looking at the 80-20 rule. So if, you know, if our audience, 80% of it, then it moved into the core. If it was um, the specialty areas, then it was outside of that, and we put that back over onto another area. In addition is then we also looked at, as I said, movement within the company. As individuals potentially would go to different uh, divisions and different segments, um, did, was it applicable, and is this something that, as they were coming over, that we needed to have at the different levels? We all know that as someone is with the organization for a while and everything, as they become a more of a specialized and uh, have more experience and expertise, where the competencies were then going to be become more divisionalized and more role-based versus, again, the, the larger group coming in and being dispersed amongst the different divisions. Okay, thank you. I think we have one more question. Great. John, I'm gonna, uh, oh, go ahead. No, go, yeah, go ahead. No, go, go ahead, Ashton. You're fine. Okay, we have one more question, or time for one more question. So just real quick, guys, um, how important is the technology supporting the application? For example, the end user experience. Well, I think when, when we started working on competencies, which was several years ago, we try to work with spreadsheets and um, it was just impossible to get buy-in from the users and uh, if you look at the advantage of having a software and application for it you don't have to update everything you have it all in one place you can run reports for multiple employees and you can't do that with with Excel or Word or what, whatever so um, I think there's a lot of basic work to do for which you do not need a system at the beginning, so for developing competencies, for example, but once it, we, we, once you start with assessments, it's really impossible to do it without. And Giles, from your perspective? Yeah, so I think uh, it, I, I agree, it's not required at the early stages setting up creating competencies particularly, but the assessment process, I think there's, the, there's, there's two elements that I would point to. Uh, one is just the user experience. Uh, I think today's users are very familiar with so many different uh, web-based applications and 
simple ways of buying things online, etc. That if you give them uh, a, a tool that doesn't feel intuitive or simple or responsive, uh, then then they won't use it. So I think that's one big barrier. Um, uh, and, a, and a thing that a, the tool that you choose needs to be uh, uh, good at. I think the other part is obviously it needs to be a system if you want to get the big data out. So you need to be able to amalgamate everything and report on all of the data to be able to get the organizational value of um, of the uh, aggregated results uh, if you're going to use them for um, directing development or uh, uh, larger decisions. All right. Well, guys, thank you so much again. And I do want to make one uh, correction. So I pronounced or I, I spelled Giles's last name incorrectly on the on the intro slide. It's Giles Adam, and uh, these guys are available, like we said, on, as Ashton mentioned, on LinkedIn. Uh, if you need to reach out to them, I can just personally say that they are all experts in their field and. Uh, very much appreciate the collaboration and thank you again for participating in today's webinar. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right, thank you. Bye. Thank you guys for joining.